Okay, I think it's good. So yeah, so first of all, thank you all for coming and, and listening, staying to, to hear my talk. Um, yeah, so let me first introduce myself. So my name is Mary Wigleski. I'm a developer advocate at IBM and I'm with the Java developer advocacy team um, there. And we all work kind of remotely and I'm based in Chicago. Um, and also too, I'm um, a CJOC, a Chicago Java Users Group uh, board member too. So I also run Chicago Java Users Group meetups. Um, and in fact, let me also do a bit of advertisement. This Thursday, we'll be having our CJOC lightning talks. So if you, are, if you are, have a topic, I mean, even Kotlin, because we welcome anything that's like JVM based too. So if you have a Kotlin talk you want to do, we still have some slots, actually a lot of open slots. A couple of people talked to me, but they still haven't signed up yet. So if you go to our web page, our, our meetup page, you'll notice nobody has signed up, but actually some people have signed up. They just haven't told me what they're going to talk about. So if you have a topic, please, by all means, you know, please feel free. It's the time for us all to come together and do talks and not to be intimidated because everybody is very welcoming, just like you guys are in here. So, so thank you very much. Okay, so that's that. And now I should start now. Okay, so this is just a lightning talk. So I'm just, my topic, actually, I call it reactive streams, um, Kotlin style. Um, but I first of all, too, want to ask you all for being like kind to me because I actually have not done much Kotlin at all, but then I've been doing Java for quite some time. Um, but when I came and do the talk, actually Raul, because of the go-to organization, Ra Raul was saying that, well, can you come and do Kotlin? I said, oh, really? Okay, yeah, let me tr give that a try. And actually it's good because I've been doing a lot of um, reactive and reactive streams kind of um, advocacy work for my team. So then I figure this has actually have been great because I'm excited to, to learn to see how Kotlin does reactive stream support. So this is like a bit of my findings. So if you have anything that you feel that I didn't say, I don't say correctly, just feel free to, to correct me. So, so, I mean, I'm looking at this like a very good learning opportunity. So, okay, so this is my, uh, the agenda of my talk. So I'm just gonna talk a bit about reactive and then some reactive manifesto, reactive streams. And then some is essentially going into asynchronous asynchronicity with uh, in Kotlin. Um, essentially, just bring up some coroutines and also the flow. And like uh, John already talked actually a lot about the flow, which is great. And I was learning too the channels. Yeah, so that's great. And then I also talk a bit about reactive streams implementations, and then also then uh, Kotlin flows and in Spring, uh, reactive uh, Spring web flux. And then I'll talk a bit too about at the end, it's just what, what will be next that we can think of. But first of all, then I will bring up, uh, actually, let me ask you, how many of you are, already have done some reactive programming or very familiar? Oh, so that's, that's great. So quite a lot of you, so, so that's awesome. So, and uh, you must be then familiar too with the reactive manifesto. Um, so, but that, I mean, just for those who are not familiar, so let me also quickly go through. So um, basically, Reactive Manifesto came out from Lightband, and Lightband is the company that invented uh, Scala uh, by Martin Odersky. So that's his company. And so that's the Scala company, and then they also then eventually develop um, Akka, which is the reactive systems. Um, and uh, right now there's Akka and it's also Lagom, which is a microservices uh, framework that's based on um, Scala as well, but they also support um, Java as well. Um, so yeah, so reactive manifesto is essentially a set of guidelines that guide to say what should be, you know, what basically the principles that, you know, should be present in any reactive systems. So that's what Reactive Manifesto is. And, um, and I won't go into all the details since this is lightning talk, but just want to bring to your attention. So, so here it is, there are four uh, basic uh, um, essential, very essential like core principles in reactive systems. And first and foremost is being uh, systems that needs to be very reactive, uh, responsive. By responsive, it means that request comes and then the response should come back in a very timely manner. So that's what responsive is in a nutshell. And then elasticity means that if there are lots of you know, requests coming in, then your system should respond um, accordingly and increase the number of resources to handle these requests. Or maybe if not, then you want to slow down. So essentially it also deals with a bit of controlling the back pressure too. So if you have heard of back pressure, um, so which I'll go into a bit little more. And then there's um, in, in the third property too would be like being resilient. So meaning that um, the systems too in failure condition needs to be able to respond um, also 
um, ferried in a timely manner too. And then their systems, in order to be able to do this, it needs to have very good replication um, capability and your systems and isolation and all those things to make resiliency happen. Meaning any, you know, the system needs to be able to get bounce back quickly under failure condition. And then all of these three um, kind of basic principles they are all able to do their work that like that. The properties are basically upheld by systems being very message driven too. So by message driven, it means that um, essentially all of the components are communicating with each other through messaging. And then me messaging too, it's also like dealing with location transparency that two components can talk with each other um, basically without exactly knowing where it goes to, but the, but the underlying system should know how to send all your messages to like specific addresses too. Um, and that's actually different too than event-driven. Even though we're talking about asyn asynchronous systems being event-driven, but by message-driven, we means that like messages needs to know where it goes to, but event-driven meaning that there are messages that happens. It's like a pop up scenario in which you have messages that needs to be published, that needs to be broadcasted. It doesn't have an, it doesn't have to know where it's going to because it's up to the to the to those who are interested in the message to subscribe to it or kind of essentially like observe the observer will then be observing like for any messages that comes out. So that's a quick thing about this. Okay, so now then I'll also bring up um, about reactive streams and that's the specifications that coming that came out of the reactive systems too. Um, essentially, this reactive streams is basically a set of also like guidelines and standards to guide systems um, to basically um, non blocking um, asynchronous uh, event driven systems and has um, and being able to deal with back pressure. So that's a reactive streams and essentially it came out from JDK nine from the Java util concurrent flow. Um, and uh, so that's with reactive streams. And one thing to note is that reactive streams doesn't specify any Im implementations. It's essentially, it's a set of um, interfaces that it defines. Um, and it's actually, look at it, it's pretty simple. It's publish, subscribe, and processing, and processor, and pipeline, I guess, yeah. So it, it's essentially impl like it, implementation free, but it's let, it basically let those, let the provider to implement uh, what it should be. It doesn't tell you how to do it, essentially. Um, and then, okay, so now let's take a look then. So just now to John also mentioned about the cold flows, hot channels. In fact, I, I found that article too. I was reading about it and thank you to John explained it very well. And, and I think one of the gentlemen talking about uh, Roman too, that I found out from JetBrains, he's an expert on this and he wrote an article actually on cold flows, hot channels. So essentially there in reactive streams is that concept of cold streams and hot streams. So by cold streams, it means that um, essentially they, they, you know, you, you, the, you don't have to worry about when, when you have the, you know, you're dealing with data streams coming out and then basically if it's cold, then, then essentially it's cold, it's not already connected. So then like when you're done with it, it, it will actually taking, be taken care of itself. So you prevent like any kind of memory leak that occurs. But hot streams, essentially it's kind of, it's, Think a bit more like a database, for example, something that's already connected underneath. And then if, if you're dealing with hot channels too, then you have to worry about closing the connection at the end. So that's kind of essentially what those means. And then in any kind of reactive streams, I mentioned a bit earlier too about back, back pressure and also like circuit breaker. So essentially, that's the thing you may be asking too, is that any kind of systems that are exist in existence that are like they're doing imperative style, doing synchronous, thing way they still you can still write callbacks a listener to kind of deal with you know asynchronous asynchronicity but then essentially to reactive streams why we need that is why it is better is because it handles back pressure in a very is a more in a more efficient manner and just let me give you a quick example of back pressure in case some of you who are not familiar with back pressure just a real life example i was actually in um, north carolina for a conference called all things open um, a couple months ago and then they were giving out free drink tickets for all of us to go to. And there were like so many participants, right? You go into a bar and then there were only like two bartenders. And there's, so everybody stand behind one line. I think there's probably like 500 people there. And so when you think about it, I immediately thought, well, there's back pressure. That's, that's what it's trying to illustrate, back pressure is. So essentially you only have two servings, people serving, right? All the requests and so many people going through. And that's what back pressure is. And then basically, 
the processor, request processor is not able to keep up with the demands coming in. So the, the you know, if you think about not in computing terms, in that case is, is that you probably want to then have additional servers to serve all of these people. So in computing terms, it would be something like you want to spawn off, like have threats, more threats to handle all of these requests. So in, in a kind of crude way, that's how I describe about back pressure. So that's what it is, is that reactive streams is built to kind of handle back pressure in a more efficient manner. And then there's also another concept is also dealing with circuit breaker. So a circuit breaker essentially is, is just like a failures or failure occurs, then you want the system to be able to respond to it quickly and basically stop the error from propagating itself. So that's what like circuit breaker is. So that's what reactive streams has also has good mechanism to deal with that kind of scenario. Okay, and then also then a quick thing too about implementations of reactive streams, um, because earlier I talked about this, it doesn't tell you how to implement, it's just interfaces. So these are like um, in Java, and now also in Kotlin too, as I'm finding out, these are basically the um, popular libraries that support reactive streams. So there's also our socket, I like to point that out if you have not uh, heard about it yet. There's this reactive socket, it's based on reactive streams too. Um, and essentially, it's a bit of a lower level on a protocol level, but it's actually application level protocol based on layer five and layer six um, uh, reactive socket. And it's supposed to be more efficient than WebSocket over, over like HTTPS, for example, or gRPC. Um, and um, so that's our socket. And then there's also Vertex, which is, uh, come, came, comes out of uh, Eclipse Foundation. And Red Hat is very much behind Vertex too. And then Pivotal has Reactor, which is through the Spring Web Flux. Um, and then RX Java, I'm sure a lot of you are, are Android developers, then there's, there's RX Java or, or RX Kotlin too. Um, then there's also another project, uh, it's basically a micro profile coming out of Eclipse uh, Foundation that's actually supporting microservices um, implementations. And that they also recently started supporting um, reactive streams as well. And yeah, so that, that's what it is. So this is, then I'll come, come into like talking about Kotlin in this case. So Kotlin, how, what does it, you know, has, has it done then in terms of supporting reactive streams? So basically um, Kotlin has, has the uh, extension function. So basically through that is able to basically extend like RX Java's capability too. So this is just an example too, like right here, um, that's how it, that's how it, it's uh, doing it. The list, for example, a list, and then you do the to observable, and uh, basically over here, um, that's what that's what it is. This is a sample for doing that. And so basically, um, RX Kotlin is basically a lightweight library that adds convenient extension functions to RX Java, and that's what I have in my notes. And uh, you basically can also use RX Java with Kotlin out of the box too. But Kotlin also has language features. Um, uh, such as like extension functions that can streamline usage of RX Java even more too. So yeah, so that that's what it is. So, so now then I'll talk a bit then about asynchronicity in Kotlin. So everybody knows, I, you being Kotlin experts here, then coroutines are basically the features that um, or capability that that's being used um, to handle like asynchronous um, event-driven um, programming in, in the language. Um, so through like your the code on the code level too is that you basically can do a launch and that's what it launches the, the code routine. And then you can then over here to actually I have a kind of quick example over here and I basically also put down the, the GitHub um, link to that. Um, and basically you do a launch and then you can then, that's what you signal to um, Kotlin itself that it is a coroutine. And basically too, like, like in there, you're also making use of the delay function in order to like um, doing some kind of delay, right, in, in your code. Um, and then what else? Uh, okay. And then the, the other thing too is that uh, coroutines are good. They are uh, probably more handles more basic type of like maybe um, single stream, for example. But if it gets to like more multiple data streams coming in, then you probably want to turn to using like flow. Um, so flow and sequences, for example. So that, that's in, in flow. And the, the advantages too of Kotlin is that um, like, like why we want to maybe choose Kotlin over Java is that Kotlin has a lot of advantages too. Among other things, there's like null, uh, the null safe, safety and very strong statically type nature. Um, it's for very strong DSL support too in Gradle. 
and also the extension functions, and also it, it, it has great interoperability with Java APIs as well. Um, so this is like a, a, an example too of a Kotlin flow in here. Um, so you basically do flow and then the collect will is essentially collects from the original flow and basically um, take the results from it. Um, and then it basically collects and then you can emit the value to the resulting flow. And this is basically the, um, the, the well, the flow comes out from your coroutines uh, core library. So that, that's, that's where it comes, it's, it's coming from. So now then I'll then, um, just now I just quickly kind of touch upon that, but now I want to then talk a bit too about Spring Reactor support for Kotlin too. So it's basically Spring comes out since Spring Boot 2.2 is basically allowing um, or supporting Kotlin. So then it allows the usage in a, in a more imperative way um, and in basically making use of Kotlin flow. And from what my research is that is, is actually quite interesting how Kotlin flow itself too, it, it's, um, I think Roman too, they are saying they study all of the implementations of reactive streams and then they basically look at it and then basically look into like Kotlin, like how then it can basically support um, um, like conceptually too, um, it's also supporting reactive streams too. Um, and I'm finding it to be quite very interesting. And in spring too, basically it, it has this wing uh, uh, web flux um, that's in, in spring, it's basically making use of flux and mono. Um, Flux is essentially is supporting like multiple multiple streams and mono is like for a single stream. So basically, um, that's what that's how um, Spring is able to um, uh, support that. And and I just wanted to also point out is that um, and, uh, Spring basically is built uh, the I should say Spring Web uh, Flux is basically built on top of reactive streams and with interoperability in mind. So then, Reactor is also the Spring Reactor is basically um, has like it is actually used for two different purposes, which is the reactive streams implementation um, that can be used everywhere in the spring reactive infrastructure. It, it's actually also the default like reactive public API has that exposure to that too. Um, let's see. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I'm a little bit kind of still new to this. So then I have some notes, but then now, now it's kind of, um, I didn't do a, a good job, so I couldn't, couldn't even tell. But anyway, so that's, that's what it is. It's basically the spring reactor um, uh, supporting Kotlin, it's basically is through the flux and the mono, and then also interoperating with, with the flow API. Um, and then here too, I just wanted to point out some of the key points too in spring reactor support. Um, Basically, um, the flow itself is actually push based, um, but then flux itself is, is actually more like a push and then pull kind of hybrid. In any kind of reactive systems, if you think of um, like the streams, basically you streams are coming out and basically it would be like in Java. So basically you would just do a subscribe. In, for example, RxJava, you do a do an, an observe and basically subscribe to that particular stream. And that's actually, um, um, actually, let me see. That's, uh, yeah, so, I'm sorry, actually. Okay, so anyway, so flow itself is, is essentially is a push base completely, whereas then flux is actually doing a push because then it signals that it, it's actually doing a subscribe because once you're subscribing, you're like pulling the, pulling the data to yourself. You're pulling things off of, um, from, from the stream and then the stream would then do a push to whoever is requesting that. So that's more like a push pull kind of hybrid kind of implementation in Flux. But whereas Flow itself, it comes out as, as strictly like a push, push based implementation. Um, and actually back pressure too is basically implemented um, using suspending function in Kotlin. So that's one thing. And then Flow also only has a, Flow itself has a single suspending uh, collect method and operators are implemented as extensions. Um, and operators are basically easier to um, implement this because of coroutines co uh, co um, in Kotlin. And extensions also allow to add custom um, operators to the flow too. Um, and then collect operations are basically suspending functions. Um, so yeah, so those are like the, the added advantage of using Spring, um, the Spring uh, Reactor support for Kotlin. Okay, let me see. okay so then now um, after it kind of have to come through this 
these points, I just want to bring up then what, what would be next? Because Kotlin flows and channels, and actually flows are, they just came out to quite recently. Um, but I believe too, just from what I have done in the research is that it's, it looks like then the flow itself would have, um, would, there's still a lot of room to, for some improvement in there, the flow. So I believe there will still be some enhancement made to it, made to it too, to be made to it. And then of course too, um, Kotlin being a, like a, very strong um, language, I guess, for Android now. So it, I can imagine that they probably will have also this asynchronous support um, in Kotlin will be um, will, will become even more important because of like mobile usage, for example. And then another thing too, like um, in this case, I'm, I'm kind of curious too to see also like if our socket may have any kind of um, uh, support in Kotlin as well that I have not been able to fi find out yet. Um, so that, that may be something um, to kind of look out for. And then there's this one slide too I'd like to share because essentially it's, it's about the, the reactive socket again. Um, there's actually recently in October, there's a new foundation that just got formed and it's basically coming out from the Linux foundation. It's called Reactive Foundation. So that's actually formed by six companies, um, Facebook, Netify, Alibaba Cloud, Pivotal, Lightband, and Vlingo. So they are the ones that actually are strongly supporting the R socket, um, this uh, uh, specification and implementation of such two. Um, essentially, R socket itself is open source and, and layer five and six communication uh, protocols that's based on reactive streams too. And it's actually it supports also like bi-directional um, in the communication. So it's supposed to be a lot faster too. So, and then just one example is that actually in Facebook, um, if you look into the feed on Facebook, that's actually, they are using our socket to implement to just, just FYI to let you know, so. Okay, so then with that uh, comes to the end of my talk, and I think I already go over time. As, so, but I just want to give you a, like a page of all the resources to some of the things on reactive streams, reactive foundation, the reactive extensions too, and then some of the, the um, articles and um, places where I've looked to do my research is um, the, the bottom too. And also that particular article about cold flows and hot channels too, that I've also put a link in there, and I can make these um, slides be available for you for your reference too. So here, thank you. I just want to thank you for sitting through my talk and then I'm, I'm a bit little, still not quite familiar. So I appreciate your patience with me. And here um, I wanted to announce again that CJUG will have a lightning talk this coming Thursday if you want to sign up for that. And then also just uh, one thing because I work for IBM. So there's also just wanted to bring to your attention. You don't have to sign up, but it's basically there's a free tier IBM cloud account that you can sign up for. And inside there are many things you can even like now you can actually create an open shift cluster, for example, um, things of that nature that there is some free tier usage. Um, so if you visit this um, tiny link, um, tiny URL link, yeah, you can sign up for that. And then with that, it comes to the end. And thank you again uh, very much for, for sitting through my talk and yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.